Hello and welcome to a live edition of Theorycraft. I'm Ben, that's Jack, and we are two dudes that rant, rave and ramble about all things sci-fi, comic book or just movie history. This week we are doing what is has to be Disney's poor, poor attempt of sci-fi before they bought Star Wars. Yes, I am talking Tron. Tron and Tron Legacy, the gloriousness that is sci-fi epicness that was just pure I have no utter, I have no words for it to be fair it's just it's utter rubbish. A, it's in a category all of its own. Yes. I mean this was in the days where CGI had only just come in. So at least I can give it its dues with that. So without further ado, let's get ready to run. <laughs> so the biggest issue I find with the original Tron movie is that the plot shifts about every 10 minutes. Like It's so unsure what it wants from itself, despite the fact that it's only got one director, one writer, one screenplay person. It shifts and wax and wanes along the movie so frequent that I struggle to comprehend what the plot is. Well, I got, I got so lost with the thing that I had to do some, I had to do some research, and I found out that if you type in What's going on? Like, if you have search results for what's going on with what's going on with Tron Legacy, and so mm -hmm. on, it's like actually quite a lot of results come up. It turns out because it turns out a lot of people just like me didn't have a clue, even when mm -hmm. watching the thing. I mean, the thing is with the original Tron movie, I think it was Disney's first attempt to trying to do sci-fi because it was a few years after Star Wars had been and gone, and there was a big yeah. void of sci-fi-ness. Yeah, because it was that kind of technology which like gave birth to things like Toy Story. Exactly, it was the generate. It was sort of the backdoor to all things Pixar and CGI. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, that backdoor yeah. definitely. That backdoor was definitely busted. It had a few leaky cracks, if just you can tell just by watching the thing. God, it is so glitchy. This movie. I mean, let's start off with like the whole initial relationship between the users and the programmers. Right. So the whole concept within Tron, at least, is that all programs look like they're users, but the programs see their users as like gods in a sense. Like, yeah. it's kind of a weird one. I can't the like dress style with a lot of them. They have a loincloth over like the weird suits that they have. It kind of reminds me of like ancient Greeks or even Romans, where they had so many different deities, nobody knew who to pray to. No, but. I mean, like, obviously in Tron Legacy, the main bad guy is Clue, which is the tech version of the main character, Kevin Flynn. But I completely forgot that Clue was also incorporated in the first movie because he's in it within the first five minutes and gets obliterated. He gets destroyed by the main bad guy, which is Master Control. Yeah. But when it came to Tron Legacy, they revived him. And they just showed this random bizarre scene where you got Kevin Flynn is in the grid. It pulls up from the main floor of the, the grid, a sort of mirror of sorts, and he just holds his hand against it. It scans him and makes a mirror version of himself that becomes Clue. But the thing I kind of find a bit odd, does that mean this is the original Clue that he had, or is this Clue 2.0 that's been corrupted by the mass control? Because that would make more sense of him being a bad guy that way, instead of it being that he's a main bad guy because he took the literal sense to what meant to be the perfect system. Well, because what's, what's the point? What's the point in making another couple copy of himself like two point Yeah, this is it. Like I, I struggle to comprehend. The, I know it's been some years between the two movies, but at the same point, there had to be some logistics of cohesiveness regardless i mean it gets even worse when you've got a tv series that's set after tron legacy which is a whole other mind fudgery in itself because uh, just a bit. well the thing is by the end of tron legacy you got kevin flynn decides to wipe the entire server of all the programs everything inside the grid because clue was basically gone completely bonkers so he absorbs Clue into himself, but then Tron Uprising, the TV series, is meant to be set after the Tron Legacy movie, 
and you got all these programs that are in a city, but it's like it doesn't explain how the programs are still alive. Crew is still alive, and the only thing in it is that they got the original actor that played Tron is back, and they have him basically say that because of the actions of him being obliterated by Clue, he had to heal himself, so he couldn't be Tron. Someone else had to take up the mantle. So it's very Batman Beyond-esque, like, in that sort of regard. Yeah, what was the actor's name? Was it Kevin something? I can't remember his name. I can't remember the actor's because, name. Because the only thing is, I, remember, I was looking through a few different scenes of this thing, and it was the original, it was the actor who was in the original t Tron, which was back in 1980, what was it? Three. 19, 1983. I think so. Oh god, I love just I love just watching that film just for the sure horrendousness of it. But you can't, but you can't bash on them too much. They had to work with what they had. It's basically mm -hmm. it's it's the baby of what became um, CGI, basically. Yeah. And I ha I remember for that movie when I was looking up a few interesting facts. That same actor had a lot of de aging done to him in CGI to make him look a bit younger. Yeah. And it's actually incredible the amount of, like. Of effort, which they actually put into yeah. that like, age him down, but also the yeah. amount of effort in the film is, well, there's no understanding. It's at its complete cinematic brilliance, but the plot yeah. and so on is just for me, it's just garbage. Oh, just oh, it's just a confusing mess. Yeah, I mean, the other thing as well with like the original movie is, <sighs> I struggle to comprehend the plot. So, the idea is that Kevin Flynn, he was a programmer. He got his game design stolen by his boss and his program, Mass Control. So that's why he ends up back at where he used to work and then gets digitized into the digital world. That's fair enough. But he somehow some has like this little arcade empire of sorts in San Francisco. They never explain how he's able to afford it, despite the fact that he got sacked from a programming job, which... Considering this is back in the 80s, this wasn't a very highly class paid job as far as I'm aware. No. Because computers had only existed for the like, best part of, what, 15 years at that point, give or take? Uh, I think maybe possibly slightly, probably slightly more than that. But it's just the amount of, I mean, the amount of, like, you remember the, um, well, you kids won't remember the days of the old floppy disks. But these floppy disk things, the amount of um, gigabytes and so on that used to exist just on these, like, just on these floppy disks, and now obviously we've got car SIM cards and whatever and so on. Those things used to be probably about the size of a big flatbed truck just to hold mm -hmm. all that data. So that's yeah. how, like, how much power that these computers were using back then. Yeah. But let me just go through my notes because I've, I've written so many notes based on this film. It's, it's hard to try and keep track of it. I mean, what was that? Like, the mass control is obviously meant to be designed by the main bad guy, but then somehow it gains sentience and decides to, because he's bored, wants to hack like the the White House or the Kremlin just because he's bored. Just because. Yeah, which again I find like a very odd idea, because I mean I would. Let me see if I can find, let me just double check which panel did I put it in. Can we get this up? There we go. Hey. So, <laughs> so it just, it looks like Zordon. I was, was, about, to say, I was about to say, is this a Zordon prototype? <laughs> it looks kind of like Zordon if he just got really sunburnt and really miffed off. And fat. <laughs> yes. But the thing is, is like that program there is meant to be the I think that's meant to be the like human the program humanized version. It's very confusing. So like I say, all programs look like they're users. So the user in question is meant to be the guy that Master Control is manipulating, but they're using the same actor. Like I think it was so low budget this film that they just copied and pasted the actors. Yeah, well it definitely, it definitely looks that part, but even just what you said, I had to just sit there just for a minute and go, right, hang on, I'm still following you just now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are a lot of design choices in this movie that I do, I just, I, obviously this was very early on and it's hard to try and fathom. Like, they're just like the, pe the old painting overalls is what they look like. 
Yeah, I mean, my next point I want to bring up is the identity discs. Now, yeah. I love the plot of it. I like the idea that all your information gets saved onto an identity disc because obviously, as you said earlier, we had floppy disks and eventually CDs. It was a way of mass information. Yeah. But this is where it starts to get a bit dodgy in terms of how low budget we were. Because here is Tron in his suit and his identity here we disc. Go. <laughs> oh, my God. God, like you can tell that's literally just the frisbee with glow in the dark tape. Like literally, yeah. the the majority of these suits was literally white overalls and then neon paint, and that was it. I mean, the thing is, I find really odd is the faces. I don't know if it's meant to be like they're a, very, but they're very green though, aren't they? It's like a, it's like a very rustic green, like a very rusty green. Mm. I mean. Like I say, this is very, very early on, obviously, and it's hard to try and comprehend what's actually going on and in this movie. And obviously, back then with the actors, like I'm sure they were trying to do some kind of green screening or masking, but even that hadn't been invented well, up to that point. I wonder why they look green. Is because of the lighting wasn't good enough? I was, I was thinking that actually, and plus, obviously, like sometimes I've noticed this sometimes when I edit videos as well that it depends on like if you got like. Not so much on your file size, but the amount of footage that you have. The more that you edit, edit it, and you like piece parts and mm. pieces together over time, gradually the color starts to wash out, or yeah. the color starts to become a bit more exaggerated than it actually is. So yes, I, so like if I was like chopping like a video up in bits and pieces as I keep editing it, you might see me get a lot more oranger. So I reckon that's just like might just be a little bit of a fault. But then again, they're having to work with like the whole. Uh, camera operating system, which was mm -hmm. still very clunky back then, and obviously it's the baby of CGI, so yes. you can't rag on them too hard for it, but it's just fun to look back on it now and just think, oh god, what was this? <laughs> I mean, the thing is, it takes a while for the film to actually get going. Like, it, there's a bit where him and two programs escape like the, ga the game um, arena, because for whatever reason, they add into the idea of it being like Gladiator, where any weak programs have to fight just for the sake of entertainment for the master control. And then obviously and, the bikes and everything, which was wicked, by the way. The, to be fair, I give them dues that the CGI, for what they had, was all right. It was just the costumes themselves were just a bit... Painting overalls and neon paint. Yeah, I mean... It, like I say, it took a while for things to get going in the movie. And there's a scene where they get into a random part of the grid in Tron, where the programs revive themselves through power, which looks like pools of like pure water. Yeah. And it's at that point that Flynn suddenly gains abilities because he's not a program, he's a digitized user. So he drinks yeah. some of the power and he ends up being able to manipulate his surroundings. <laughs> <laughs> Why wasn't this like the first thing he was able to do? If he's a user, I understand obviously he's probably a bit brain scrambled from the whole digitization to what it is. But at the same point, like you could imagine at least they'd have like a minor they could have at least had like minor moments where little things would randomly happen. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, I do love how much time and effort they put into the techie side of stuff because there was like those little annoying things that was yes, no, yes, no. That's bits of information because, ladies and gentlemen, kids who are too young to understand, computers were originally just one and zero. Like it was yes or no. Like it took a long time before we get to where we are today. And bits oh. of information were literally just one bite of information it can either say yes or it could say yo that was that was literally it yes or no but they had they even hint towards that in tron legacy like on his shelf in his like special room he's got these little spiky things that are the bits but like i say it's it's a very odd design as a whole in tron the first movie because they only just got into the idea of cgi yeah and this is where a character that I said to you looked a bit too phallic and a bit too dodgy called Dumont. So, ladies and gentlemen, I present is... to you and that. Right. So there's Dumont. 
Uh, I, yeah, very. I, 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 so the point being is that Dumont's thing is that he's a communication thing. He's meant to be a means for all the other programs to communicate with their users. But the thing is, again, like I say, all programs look like their users. So there is an old man in the Tron movie who doesn't like mass control, and neither does his program, coincidentally. But it's just, I don't understand the style choice. Like, his arms look like he's a T-Rex. Like, he's like... Nye, 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 nye. <laughs> like, I just, I'm trying to comprehend as to what on earth they were attempting with this. Well, what, what it looks like, what it looks like to me, I know obviously Yu Gi Oh wasn't around by then, but it looks like a Yu Gi Oh monster that you can see. It, it does actually. It does <laughs> kind of. I think it's the big tall hat. It looks like a Yu Gi Oh pope. As, as soon as I saw it, it looks like it looks like a Yu Gi Oh monster that you summon. <laughs> see, I was thinking it looks a bit more like Yu Gi Oh, but as a pope, because he's got like a very tall <laughs> hat. <laughs> well, he ain't got but... any rosary beads around his neck or anything. <laughs> Dear. But, yeah, I mean, what else have we got here? There's no indication how long you, they spend in the computer. Like, that's the big thing I find a bit inconsistent, also, is that... Like, also, too much, of a dis too much of a disconnect between, like, the, between the digital and real. Yes, because... I mean, I'm trying to understand the logistics of it, is that in... Tron Legacy, obviously, the original actor has been trapped in it for decades, and he does age. But then my argument is, how does he stay alive if he doesn't have any food? Yeah. Would he even age in the first place? Because he's only a digital construct. Because he's been digitised, so he's not technically human. He's been digitised into it. So would he? should he age, and would he need any, like, sustenance? I... I... I would not. I would not honestly think. I'm not honestly think so. Just because, I I wouldn't be sure that'd be even like programmed into them. If they're in that digital world, they shouldn't need it. But at the same time, if you don't have that kind of explanation in the film itself, that's mm -hmm. where all these questions pop up, and there, hence why there's content for you guys to watch like this. But the thing as well is like, he's he's been in the in the first movie. He's been in the program for what probably feels to him like a good few hours. But by the time he gets out of it, it's only been like a minute. And he, I think they do even say in Tron Legacy that time passes differently in the grid. So then by that logic, like if he if it does affect his aging, would he not age faster? See what uh, I mean? Like it's, yeah, yeah, I, it, yeah, I get what you mean. It's trying to piece together because there's so many inconsistencies with their rules. It makes me wonder, like, what the hell was going on? So I like mean, the, the rules are as clear as mud. Pretty much. I mean, the whole point of the first movie is that Flynn is trying to get proof that this game that's been publicized as the X company he used to work for was actually his idea, not his boss's. And that's how he ends up getting stuck in the digital world. And then by the end of the movie, he gets the proof, and then he's at the top of the building with his friends. That's at the top of the business building, Encom, and that's it. Like that's like that's that's the end of the movie. Like by Not the time you get nothing, well, like you just get literally a, pi a piece of them at the top of the building, all hugging each other on this helicopter pad. That they've proven that the idea was Flynn's and that this guy's been basically shimming money about and trying to hide stuff. And that's it. Like, by the time you get to Tron Legacy, apparently Kevin Flynn had somehow bought out Encom because of all these programs because he get he basically creates a game based on his time within Tron. Right. Like, I mean, the funniest part that I find most of all is that the character Tron himself isn't the main good guy. Tron is, like, his best friend's program. Yeah. So the fact that the movie called Tron isn't even based around Tron, it's just that Tron is there. <laughs> it's, like, it's like calling a film Jaws and having it about dolphins. Yes, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, the, the thing is as well, is like, 
at least with Tron Legacy, it does give us a bit more of a time gap. Like, it sort of shows us, like, Kevin's son, who's called Sam, obviously, who learns about the grid. But the way that they perceive it is, like, it's not, it doesn't exist, even though it does exist, because there's a bit where Sam spies on his dad talking to his friend about the grid and about like some random thing has happened. And then fast forward to what was the modern day when the film came out. And Sam is like just basically mess out and about down the street on a motorbike trying to not get caught. Um, and then, of course, obviously, because Kevin's not been around for years, Sam is technically the legal CEO of the company because he's the biological son, but he doesn't want the responsibilities. It's just, like... Convoluted. There's so much of this... Like, the first, like, 10 to 20 minutes of the film is all based around the idea that he doesn't want to be responsible for Ancom. It should be... The guy that is basically Tron, but in the real world, I can never remember his name, but he basically wants to take over the company instead because he knows that he's meant to be running it and go from there. Yeah. So like, I do love the nostalgia idea that they bring in the fact that Kevin's friend, who's the one that's the legal guardian to Sam, has a pager that's obviously decades old and is the only means of contact between Kevin and him. And he randomly gets a page from supposedly Kevin saying that he's still alive or whatever. So instead of like the him and Sam go to the arcade, it's just Sam. And then he gets transported into the digital world. And I have to say, at least they put a bit more effort into how the suits came about. Because when he gets transported into the new grid, he's still wearing his original clothes. But then they get taken off him by the weird female characters that then dress him up in the grid like aesthetic. Yeah. So at least they put a bit more intricacy with that. I do love that. Well, would you? But, there's... Yeah, go on. But my biggest issue is that yes, they do have the identity discs, but it's <sighs> I don't fully understand the point of them because if it's meant to be like. The whole idea is that if the identity disks get destroyed, then it destroys the whoever it is tied to. So for a user to be digitized, it would be unbelievably painful, obviously. Yeah. But more to the point, like it's in the back here, but does that mean that it's a neurological implant of sorts? Like because then obviously when he goes back to the real world, what happens? Like yeah, uh, yeah, because that's, uh, that's a hard one to answer. Yeah, but you were going to say something. Yeah, I was going to say just because this question has popped up on lot, like quite a lot online for years, as I found out. And mm -hmm. you could just like say your personal opinion, but would you say that people can watch Tron Legacy without watching the original Tron, or should you watch Tron and then Tron Legacy? I mean, like, do, you, do, you, do you need to watch the first Tron? To appreciate it, I would say yes, to sort of get a rough idea. But at the same point, no. Because yeah. like they do give a brief understanding of things throughout the movie anyway. I mean, it's so disjointed from the first one. The only thing that you need to sort of fully understand is that the design of why certain things look certain ways. Because you've got the weird airships and stuff. Let me see if I can find the right, right images of... Well, tell you what. Let's have a look at how Clue 1.0 compared to 2.0 looks. Because that's one thing that I am quite impressed with is the fact of how starkly different just because they got better like designs of stuff. I mean, I love the fact that it is literally he's been de-aged in the new movie. Like, it's so seamless. Yeah, but, I, I, I was honestly quite shocked of how they did this but give them credit it's abs it's absolutely brilliant mm -hmm. i mean the thing is as well is i don't understand why his coloring is yellow because all of the good programs are blue okay all of the bad programs are red that's the logistics of it all but then you have clue 
that is yellow. So I'm trying to comprehend if this is like some weird like law with like um, lightsabers where the different colors mean different things, or whether it's just it's a style choice. Well, I'm not sure. I think it might just be a style choice, but um, yeah, with like all the different colors mean like meaning different things. Obviously, not going to go into Star Wars because that's a video in itself, and I could talk for about a good hour or so just about lightsaber colors. But mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just because I suppose like they have like the straight. Um, like just the straightforward blue, like the red, but the yellow, I think is just for clue. It's just, I think it might just be like because of the craze wanting them to stand out, but because yellow, it just kind of creates that kind of intrigue. So going, oh, mm-hmm. okay, like who exactly are they? But then again, it depends on, I don't know, can it depend on like maybe the digital, maybe the digital person, like where they fit inside this digital world in terms of like hierarchy and status? Well, I don't know, because then you have, like, Sam, when he's the user, when he gets digitised, he's, like, a very light blue, and the same goes for both Kevin and, obviously, Cora, which is an ISO program, which is something that I've been trying to struggle my head around at the end of the movie. Yeah. But we'll get to that in a moment. I mean, like, there's... Just have a quick comparison between the CGI of like the original stuff compared to the old stuff. So that's the original one where you got Tron on the left. Is that Tron? Yeah. It, no. Yeah. Sorry. You got Tron there, and then you got one of the Imperial Guards on the right. Now, it's just it's so bizarre how the costumes look because why would you give him a loincloth if you're going to put so much detail on him? For it to only be partially seen? Oh, uh, I am not sure. No comments. <laughs> but then at least the Imperial Guard looks kind of interesting. But then at the same point, it looks like he's got one of those like respirators you use when you do like DIY. Yeah, and plus they're probably quite a lot more common now considering the worldwide situation. <laughs> yes, well, that's a discussion for another day, I believe. But like, you have so many random things regarding the design choices of stuff i mean let's have a look at the original light cycles so the light cycles were now the original ones give them to i mean this is in the days of like computer programming and everything was only just coming in it's probably been a bit rough smoothed out over the years but like i just love how despite it being so blocky it looks kind of interesting yeah, I mean, just like you had kind of the um, oh, what's that? Freak, what's that game called? I can't remember if it was on the old. Uh, oh, gonna make a sound old again. You know, those old brick Nokia phones where you had the snake game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It well, kind of looked. It kind of. It had a little bit like that, except it wasn't like in Tron Legacy where like they were kind of like just free moving. It was very. Hmm. It was very. It looked like a video game, but for its time and watching it still to this day, it still looks pretty darn cool. It still looks pretty wicked. No, I completely agree. But then you have a look at like the upgrade that they did for Tron Legacy, and you can tell how much... I mean, the thing is, I argue with you that, to a degree, they probably have the amount of money they sh- they um, did for the original movie compared to modern day was probably the exact same amount. It's just that the technology's advanced that much that you have something like that for CGI. Like... Yeah, that's how scary. Like it's been what? It was twenty years. Give all te- well, no, no, it's twenty than that. thirty years then. So yeah, thirty years difference in CGI. So, um, that's about 30, 36 years. Thirty six, give or take. Like it's kind of spooky how much difference in CGI. And like you say, like it was down to Tron existing that we ended up with Pixar years later. Yeah, so you could thank that for Toy Story. <laughs> And everything else in between. but Yeah, and plus, that interesting fact, which I messaged you while I was at work today. Um, yeah, for any of you guys who are interested in Tron, who are interested just in those cycles, you may have seen them in in one of Flo Rida's videos. Um, they like the rapper. I don't like his music. But he was, like, riding around in, on the street on one of them. And it's actually mm-hmm. pretty cool. And those bikes you can actually purchase. There's only a very few of them made and I think there's only the like elite of society can actually get one. But mm. they are actually not as expensive as I thought they were. Then you can actually get them. I've seen YouTube videos of them 
uh, driving, my God, it's it's clunky as heck. Yeah. And those things, and those, and you can own one yourself for fifty five grand. That's not bad. I mean, I'd rather something else for fifty five grand. But there well, we go. What, well, what about Batman's tumbler? True. It's a bit yeah, more practical. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a, I mean, it's a tank on wheels. Well, the thing is, like, speaking of tanks, this is what I love about like the original movies, like they. So the majority of like the like designs and stuff was based loosely on his game, and then yeah. they copied and pasted it into the later Tron movie. But you got like the original; yeah, yeah, yeah. they called it tanks, I think, but I can't remember what they were. But like, God Almighty, this was so blocky! Oh like, my goodness! Like it's literally just Tetris. It it looks so. That's that's what I was trying to remember. It looks like Tetris. Yeah, I mean. That's like the original Tron version of it, okay? So then we go to the Tron Legacy version, and oh my god, how much difference and detail that they had in this. Look at that. Like, it's oh all seamless. Like That's gorgeous. It's just so bizarre. Like, I obviously understand that this, it was early days with the CGI, but the thing that I find so funny about the original movie was that the original ships, because it was literally floating blocks, there was bits where Flynn's trying to fly one, and bit by bit, that it was falling apart, but he still had, like, the main console to the point where it was literally just, like, the top half of it was still survived. Yeah, yeah. But with this, it actually looks pretty genuine for what it is. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like I say, there is so many random bits of these movies that are inconsistent or just trying to do too much sci-fi at once i think that's the biggest issue with it was it was trying too hard to be sci-fi to beat star wars yeah but yeah but that that's that's not trying to climb everest without legs i mean at the end of the day like sci-fi is always going to be evolving to a degree but it was just so try hard these movies like even the sequels are mind fudgery in itself because the whole main plot is that Clue is obviously obsessed with the idea of creating the perfect program or perfect grid because his programming is literal, like he's doing what Flynn asked him. Yeah. But then, by sheer fluke, because of creating the perfect system, they end up creating something called ISOs, which are these programs that have their own sentience, they have their own mindset. And supposedly they're the answer to life and everything in between. It's kind of reminds me of like uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. What is the answer to life and everything? 43. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, there is there's like an over the top bar fight scene, which I can't fully fathom. Like there's this weird character in it called Zeus. Or he goes by Zeus, so but like there's yeah, but yeah, when I looked at it up, looked it up on like the um, what? Well, how do you say it? IMB, IMDb, IMDb, like IMDb. It's just it's spelled. It has a weird spelling. I think it's like it's said as I think it's said as Zeus, but it's spelled but it's spelled like Zus, I think, mm -hmm. or something like that. It's very weird. Yeah, I mean, like you have this weird bar fight scene, and then you have like Flynn turns up to try and save them all, and. I just I don't understand this part of the scene where basically there's a program that he uses to try and gain access to something to gain access to a vehicle, right? But instead of doing anything like really cool where you have like the grid and you can have like twiddling the things, all he does is just bonks them on the head and then that's it. Like uh, fun, right, Disney, like you need to put a bit more effort into things. Like you could literally have the idea of it being the Matrix. Where he's like, he pulls down the code yes, or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Put a bit more effort into the whole aesthetic that he's all powerful. Because the point being is like he has full control over everything because he's the guy that made it all. That's the point. Like the whole idea is that the reason why he hid away from Clue for decades is that if he leaves, then the identity disc can give them the gateway for them to all escape, and he could easily corrupt the rest of the world. That's why yeah. he stayed in. But the fact that he just literally goes, boink, let me in. Like, that's just a bit half-assed. Cop out. 
Yes, yes. But, I mean, the other thing as well is you have Tron in it, but they rename him Rinsler. He has two identity discs because they show a brief flashback where he's fighting off these rogue programs that Clue corrupted, and he ends up gaining two identity discs, which he uses as his weapons. But then he gets corrupted himself to become Clue's super soldier of sorts. But the thing is, it's like, they obviously, like, couldn't have him fight because the guy that plays Tron is a bit too old to do the fight scene. So they literally just give him a crash helmet throughout the entire thing. But you know it's Tron because he's got the, the like, weird T3 dots. Like, you know it's Tron. Yeah. But then it's just, like, he randomly starts gaining his memories as Tron again. But at the end of the movie, which at which point Flynn then absorbs all the programming back to himself and that wipes it all out. And that's why I get confused with Tron Uprising, because it's meant to be set after that. But then Clue is existent again. Does that mean that Flynn has become Clue or does that mean that Clue has a backup? I don't know. There is like, on, there's no stop, consistency. Stop, stop, stop. Oh, God, that. Sorry, my brain's just a bit scrambled. <laughs> You're telling me? Like, <laughs> I love the idea of Tron. I really do. But there are so many inconsistencies. I mean, the only thing I will say is that the idea of Tron Legacy and both Tron Uprising reminds me of Batman Beyond. Yeah, I can see why. Like, I love the idea of it. And then we're supposed to be getting Tron 3 at some point, which is going to have Jared Leto in it. But I have no idea as to how, where, when, or why this is going to work. No. Because, I mean, the weirdest part of the entire movie, okay, is like I say, you've got the ISOs. Now, I said to you the other day that, obviously, you've got Cora, who escapes the grid, with Sam Flynn. Sam is a user, so it makes sense that he ends up getting out of the program and becomes human again. Yeah, 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 yeah. But how the fudge does a program end up becoming a living thing? Because she manages to escape the grid, and then she's on the back of his motorcycle. She doesn't have a Tron looking outfit. She's wearing like black leather that somehow conveniently the like in we females' clothes. Like I don't know where the fudge he found them. And she's just on the back of his motorcycle, and then they just drive off into the sunset like a bat out of hell. And, <laughs> and that's the end of the movie. That's the biggest issue i find with tron any, is that any explanation at all anybody got one no, this is it like this is the big issue i find with tron is they don't know how to end the movie they just end up like leaving things on a cliffhanger and we don't know where it goes yeah so just right so we've had two like so we've had two basically two new films and we're still pretty much none the wiser no i mean that's pretty much the general gist of what I got today. Yeah. I just, I hope by the time we get Tron 3 that they have whittled down a bit more of the lore because, like I say, they got the TV series, they got two movies that are like a good few decades apart. I don't know what the fudge they're trying to achieve with it other than just being, it's a sci fi cash grab. I mean, there is so much merchandise that they've done off Tron Legacy, it's unreal. But at the same point, I think Tron Legacy was the lowest earning Disney movie to date because it had been such a long time between the two movies and nobody even knew, I don't think, the first movie was done by Disney because it doesn't clearly state it unless I'm remembering wrong. Well, it, it kind of does state it. I mean, I remember... Making myself sound, making us sound bloody old again. But I remember having the old VHS of Toy Story. I remember mm -hmm. having, I remember having Toy Story on VHS. You, oh, you bloody kids! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're on twenty five next year. But yeah, I, I remember having the VHS disc, and I remember if you, if I, when I would fast forward. Yeah, this is going back to the olden days. I remember when I fast forward, yeah, adding, like at the very like um, when you get to the end, it would sometimes have like bonus features at the end. Mm -hmm. And what it had, it showed you like how they made the characters, how they did the CGI and everything like that. But you actually see like one of the uh, main, 
like one of the main graphics guys, one of the main CGI developers, talking about how he made how he made all the graphics and everything for Tron and how mm. far they've come and so on. And it's only about what um, a few minutes long, maybe four, maybe three or four minutes. But those three or four minutes are absolute gold. Yes, but I mean, at the end of the day, I think we can both agree that it's a glorious movie if there was just a bit more consistency. Yeah, like that's all we ask because. You need to be able to tell a story, but I don't even know what story they're trying to tell half the time because the plot changes four or five times to the point where it gets to the end of the movie and the good guys have won. And that's it. Like You don't know what they've won, but they somehow achieved something. <laughs> yeah, just go, right, you, right, we've achieved this. What have we actually done? <laughs> yeah. And then, I mean, and then you end up just having like a kid turn to his mom going, what happened? And she's just like, yeah. I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> but I don't think we can add any more to this today, do do you? No, I don't think so. I mean, I pretty much can agree like, with what we hope to see from, uh, like, hopefully then we'll be soon the next installment of Tron. But obviously I have a good feeling that eventually in future, maybe not in this decade or maybe it, maybe it might do, but I have a feeling it's going to get remade at some point. I can definitely I, agree with that. But I mean, all, all I can say, all I can say for about it is that for Tron, considering how far it's come from, if we're talking like CGI and how far it's come with like the costumes, the bikes, the animation, so on, and going for now, you can fully agree it is looks wise, it's a cinematic masterpiece. Oh yeah, no, no doubt about that. It's just that it's got so many plot holes that it may as well be Swiss cheese. <laughs> yeah, I was just, I was just at it. I was just at it going, that's a good one. <laughs> yes, yes. So many plot holes, it may as well be Swiss cheese. But there we go. So thanks again for joining us, folks. We are, well, two nerds that just ran, rave and ramble. Jack's topic next week. What is your topic next week? Well, I... Hopefully, I'm going to be having my partner, the future Mrs. Green, which is on here, because we're going to be talking about her, one of her favourite DC characters, Poison Ivy. And also, a little thing which we do have a lot of ideas for a future Poison Ivy movie, which me, Ben over there, and Deanna, my partner, we're going to be writing an entire screenplay script you know, an actual full feature, for hopefully a full feature length film that maybe might be shopped around at some point, but we've got to write the whole thing. It's going to be a lengthy process. There is going to be some things in there which we're going to have to be a little bit quiet on because I don't want people taking our ideas. But I definitely think it's worth talking about for just a little, just a little bit of a sneak peek. For Poison Ivy, I am so glad that now soon, well, Marvel's kind of already started it and sort of with DC, but we're starting to get more female kind of dominated films where you're going to have like an entirely like female main character which is nice to see i mean we've had cow woman that's been done steph but we don't talk about halle berry we don't talk about that one that was horrible michelle pfeiffer is number one um so if we're <laughs> gonna go off so if we're gonna go off poison like poison ivy i've always wanted to see a full feature length poison ivy film with her as a main character and we do have a lot of ideas for that but you're gonna have to wait for him next week so there we go so well, thanks for joining us this week, folks. Stay safe, and we'll see you all soon. Bye.